mic on. I'm always on, John said. Oh, wait, whoa. <laughs> Is that you, Lord? <laughs> Good morning again, church. How's everybody doing? Really great to be with you all worshiping the Lord. Um, man, something about the, the time, that time that we spend in worship, right? Singing to the Lord and uh, declaring His goodness and just being reminded of how good He's been to us and how good He is and how amazing He is as we saying i just love it i looked was looking at psalm 100 this morning it says make a joyful shout to the lord right it starts off that way but you know i don't know about you guys but i don't always feel like making a joyful shout on you know sunday morning or first thing any morning anybody else with me on that like sometimes it's more like a <laughs> an irritable grumble you know or a not so joyful shout right but once we come into God's presence and we start to sing and as Alistair Begg has said we're reminded of truth in the words of the songs that we sing and, and that we've been forgiven we've been ransomed we've been redeemed we've been restored and then we have something uh, to fuel our praise as he says you know and and then we're looking um away from ourselves and all of our mess and our junk and, and looking out away from ourselves to god and we just worship we're in awe again we're reminded man he's good yeah life kind of stinks sometimes i ain't having the greatest morning every day but lord is you're still worthy to be praised amen, amen? and uh it tells us why in psalm 100 it says because his mercy endures forever his mercy or his faithful love it's everlasting it says so if you're in jesus you're in christ you've been forgiven of your sin right you've been shown grace we've been given what we don't deserve and mercy we've not been given what we do deserve amen the judgment of god that is something to sing about and to praise god about um so speaking of reasons to praise and to sing and to come together corporately and worship the Lord have some announcements uh, the first one is our cogs our communities of grace right uh, that we have dur during the week uh, times of fellowship outside of Sunday and the first one is Monday night uh, at uh, Beacon for Him, it's on Anaheim and Magnolia. It's Refuge Recovery, uh, led by yours truly. It's for anybody struggling with anything. You don't have to have had or have a, an addiction to alcohol, drugs, or anything like that. You could have just something in your life, something in your heart, something in your uh, mind that you struggle with. It could just be your faith in God. It can be anything. We're all recovering from sin, as I say. And so, uh, but it's, uh, we have a great time. We get into the word. We're currently going, uh, we're, we're going through the gospel of John over again on Monday nights. We've, I know we're in John here on Sundays, but we've started over and we're taking our time to walk slowly through uh, the book of the gospel of John. And we are in chapter two right now and we have open discussion and we and we hash things out and we pray for one another and it's been a really good time so i encourage you to come on out beacon for him 439 west anaheim monday nights at 6 p.m if you need more information on that tag me see me um the second one is on tuesday nights is john apodaca here right john's right in front of me what's your point john no john <laughs> <laughs> There's one at John's house is downtown if you want the information on that Tuesday nights at 630 correct 630 he's uh, on a rose on uh, near near fifth or between fifth and six so uh, see John get his number get the info. Um, I know I always mess up that announcement every time. I'm like, yeah, but cog, right? It's like sometime in, during the week, right? And you live somewhere in Long Beach. Um, but uh, John will get the more information more correct for you than I will. You can go to our website, also refugelongbeach.com. Most of the information about the cogs is there. Um, and then Saturday morning at 1130, DJ's not here, but DJ leads a prayer group down at the bluff, down off of Ocean and Cherry uh, at 1130 every Saturday. Uh, I see a lot of faces that are that here that are there every Saturday. They pray for the church. They pray for you guys, your families, us. Uh, we, they pray for Sundays and all the cogs during the week. And it's a great time. You can come with your concerns, come with your praise, um, and just come to get... Uh, in each other's lives that way where we're before the throne of grace just crying out to God and lifting up our petitions and then we get to see God answer the prayers through the week it's a really unique time God's presence is pretty thick uh, during that time in a special way and in all the all of our cogs actually we encourage you to stay plugged in throughout the week 
Um, if this is the only time you're able to come in and fellowship, we understand, but we encourage you to get and stay plugged in throughout the week because this isn't meant to be a solo act. It's meant to be done together, right? Last week we celebrated um, people getting baptized, right? Right here. How was that? Oh, that was great, right? That was an awesome time. And uh, I'm still stoked about that. But, but after that, all the celebration and the, and the commitment and the public declaration, yes, I've decided to follow him, no turning back. And then the next day, the rubber meets the road when we get up again, amen? And we face a day and we face life again. And if we're not armed and we're not, we don't have fellowship, some structure and accountability to our lives, that way we can we can get discouraged and we can bump our heads and and, and start feeling pretty lousy about ourselves and we, we need the family we need community to for support right and that's uh what cogs are for and to get deeper into the word uh and stay in the word throughout the week um we love teaching you guys the word but uh, we like to dig deeper and it's a practical application for our lives and see how we're doing with it at the cogs and so um with that um i don't think there's any other announcements other than oh we're having another baptism i'm sorry at the beach uh in september september 23rd i believe if i got that wrong i'll we'll correct it next week but we're going to be doing more baptisms at the beach so if you haven't been baptized you want to get baptized let us know about that and uh, we're all going to go down there as a family after service that day and celebrate together again it's a good time last time we went out there we almost lost a few people but <laughs> the waves were unusually gnarly out there uh but uh we'll try to make sure we hang on to everybody this time um and so actually the last couple times but um and then the other announcement is we've been out here in the park we're out here for the summer it's been great being outdoors and then uh but somebody somebody's <laughs> cameron's trying to tell me something <laughs> what are you trying to tell me wednesday 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 oh the ladies study yeah i thought that was closed Okay, yeah, we have another one, another call going is for women. It's on Wednesdays. Gil Kirkup, you can see her, but I, I was my understanding that it's been closed uh, uh, because they they're they're part way through a, a study, a curriculum they're going through. But uh, see, Gil, for the stuff that I've just fumbled and bumbled about, I don't know. So everyone's always trying to do that. Hey, don't forget to say this. And I'm already up here going. Hey, don't forget to say this. Don't forget to say that. So I'm easily distracted. In case you couldn't tell. Hi, my name is Mike. Good morning. Welcome to Refuge. Um, so. John's asking me what's my point again. Now listen, aren't you glad I'm not preaching today? <laughs> I either had too much coffee or not enough. I can't tell yet. I don't know. Ask my son. He'll tell you. He's shaking his head. We come into God's courts with thanksgiving and praise, right? Like we said earlier, we've been doing that. We praise him for what he's done, for his goodness, for his mercy, his faithful love right and then that the end of verse 5 in psalm 100 says and his truth endures to all generations his truth endures to all generations we come here to get into the word to, for god to teach us his truth about himself and about who we are and who he says we are in him and what's wrong with our lives and how he corrects it right amen we're open to that and so speaking of the truth uh, we're going to get into the Word. Open your Bibles at John chapter 16. If you need a Bible, sorry I'm saying this late, but raise your hands. Cameron has some extra Bibles over there. Just raise your hand. He'll bring you one. Open up to John chapter 16 and welcome up. Robbie is going to bring us the Word this morning. Robbie needs a Bible. <laughs> hey, can I get a Bible? Good morning. Trade you. Thank you. All right. Good to see you. I can see you now. All right. You guys are all turned to uh, John chapter 16, right? It's great to see you all this morning. And uh, why don't we stand, because we're going to read John chapter 16, starting in verse 16. So we'll stand as we read God's word this morning. All right, here we go. You ready? Everybody got it? John 16, 16. Here we go. 
Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And at this some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I am going to the Father? They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me? Verse 20, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much this morning for your word. We thank you so much for this time that we get to spend studying your word. Lord, please illuminate it to us. Help us to understand it. Help us to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you can be seated. Let me start by asking you a question this morning. Have you ever had a time in your life when you had a lot of grief? Anyone? Yes. Okay. We're all in good company here. Some of you may have been following the story recently where there were 12, was it 12? Yeah, 12 boys and their soccer coach who got stuck in a cave in Thailand. Anybody follow that story? Just happened a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. It was on the news. And the world watched as the authorities tried everything that they could in order to rescue these boys who were stuck. Now, how do you think the parents felt when they realized that their children, these were children ages 11 to 17, were stuck and not even knowing if they were alive? Pretty crazy, right? Grief, grief, grief. They, they probably felt maybe bordering on helplessness. There's nothing you can do. What are you gonna do for these children who are, are stuck? And they didn't even know if their children were going to be alive or not. They didn't know if they were going to be rescued. Well, this morning we're going to be talking a little bit about grief, but we're also going to be looking at a very important promise that Jesus gives us. See, because grief doesn't always have to stay grief, right? So let's look at it. We're going to begin in chapter 16, and uh, Jesus is going to give us a little riddle here. He says, verse 16, chapter 16, Jesus went on to say, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. And at this some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, because, and because I am going to the Father? And they kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he is saying. And Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another what I meant when I said, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. How many of you like a good riddle? Anyone here like a good riddle? Okay, I'm going to give you guys a couple of riddles. What belongs to you, but others use it more than you do? What? Ah, oh, Vianne knows this one. Say it loud. What, are they, what is it? Your, your name. Your name. Your name be, belongs to you, and yet others use it more. Okay, Vian, you can't answer this one, okay? You got to let them think a minute. No, I'm just kidding. All right, one more, one more. You can see me in water, but I never get wet. She knows it. I can see it. She knows it. Anybody know it? Your reflection. Ah, Alma. Makes sense, right? Alma, Vian. She probably taught her these riddles. So what Jesus says here is kind of like a riddle, right? Now remember, it's the final night before Jesus is going to be put to death on the cross. And he's been instructing, he's been preparing his disciples for when he leaves them. So he has given them two key commands. Anybody remember the first one? Starts with an A, found in verse 15, verse 1. Uh, 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 abide. Abide. Nancy got it. Abide in me. That's his first big command. And what's the second one? Love one another, right? So the two big commands that Jesus has given them. He's also told them that he's going to be sending them the Holy Spirit, which is going to help them to accomplish what he's told them to do. 
Now, last week, or not last week, two weeks ago, Pastor Chris gave us a really great study on the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he walks us through this life. So this is really important as we get to verse 16, because here Jesus says that in a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while you will see me. So what do you think? Do you think the disciples understand what Jesus is talking about based on their reaction? <laughs> no. No, they have no, no idea, right? Have you ever been confused about something? Anyone ever been confused? Yes, we've all been confused about things. There was a college student who was wearing a shirt with a K on it, and he went to school, and his professor asked him, what does the K stand for on your shirt? And he said, it stands for confused. <laughs> and the professor looked at him and said, you don't spell confused with a K? And the guy looked at him and said, well, you don't know how confused I am. When it comes to confusion, right, we've all been confused before. But what about when our confusion comes from something that we've read in God's word? Or, when we've, or something that Jesus has said? Has anybody ever been confused by something that Jesus has said? All right. All of us have been confused by things that Jesus has said. Maybe we can identify a little bit with the disciples. Understanding, hey, we don't understand what, what is he saying? What is he, what is he talking about here? Sometimes God's word is so deep, we just don't get it. All of us have heard of Billy Graham, right? One of the greatest evangelists who ever lived. Thousands of people have been saved by going to one of his outreaches and hearing God, the gospel. But typically we think of Billy Graham as being a man who was just on fire for the Lord. But did you know that there was once a time when Billy Graham had a crisis of faith, he had doubt. And his doubt came because he didn't understand a lot of scripture. He didn't get it. And so he wondered, can it all be true? Now, in trying to understand if it was true or not, he began to read books written by authors who were also questioning the Bible. And this began to influence how he thought. Maybe it's not all true. Maybe everything I've thought my whole life is a lie. And one of Billy Graham's friends, one of his co-ministers, his name was Chuck Templeton, was a great man of God at one time, but he also began to question if everything that God said in his word was true. And it got to the point where he actually walked away from God. And Chuck Templeton and Billy Graham were attending a conference. And during that conference, Chuck Templeton actually, from the pulpit, he, he, he actually um, mocked Billy Graham's belief in the Bible. And this rocked Billy Graham to the core. He was a young preacher, and he was just like these disciples. He just didn't understand. And here were people telling him, you're dumb for believing it because nobody can understand. So what do you think he did? Well, first of all, he began to do his own intensive research of, of the scriptures. He really wanted to see, can I get this? And it wasn't enough. He was still had a lot of doubt. He still had a lot of, what does this mean? And so what he did was he finally just decided to take a walk. And as he's out walking, it's a nice warm night. He got to a tree stump and he just came down. He had his Bible with him and he, he kneeled at this stump. And he remembered his prayer. He just started praying. This was his prayer. He said, oh God, there are many things in this book that I don't understand. There are many problems with it for which I have no solution. I can't answer all the questions about it. But then he said, but Father, I am going to accept your word by faith. I'm going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubt. And I will believe this to be your inspired word. And after he prayed that, he said he, he knew the Holy Spirit came upon him and his ministry just took off. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people gave their lives to Christ because Billy Graham was willing to put his faith in God's word, even though he didn't understand all of it. What can you and I do when we come across something in God's word that we just don't understand? Definitely pray about it. That's the first thing we should do, right? That should be our go-to. Pray about it. But even then, we may not always get it. 
So then we have to fall back on what Pastor Chuck Smith used to always say, when you don't understand something, file it in the I'll get back to it someday file and move on to what you do know. In other words, hello. <laughs> Maybe he needs to hear the word of God. <laughs> Amen. Don't dwell on what you don't know. Follow through on what you do know. And here's some things that we know without a doubt. And if you don't know it, I'm going to just tell you because this is what the Bible says. We can know it 100% to be true. Here's the first thing. I know for sure that every single one of us sitting here are sinners without a hope in the world of ever making it to heaven on our own. Every single one of us, me included, all of us, we know that 100%. No doubt about it. Here's the second thing we know. We know that Jesus loved every single one of us so much that he came to this earth to die for those sins that we can't do anything about on our own. We know that for sure. That's two things that we know. And here's the third thing that we know. If you've given your heart to Christ, you know without a doubt, 100% you're going to heaven. When you don't know what you don't know, go back to what you do know. So what does Jesus mean when he says, in a little while you will see me, after a little while you won't see me? I don't know. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to teach you. I don't know. You read three different commentaries, they all tell you something different. They don't even know. The disciples 2,000 years ago, they didn't know. How do we expect to know today? Now there's theories on what he meant, but you know what? I'm going to pull a Chris Langham here and tell you, pray to the Holy Spirit and let him tell you what he meant. <laughs> Now you would think, right, that you would think that Jesus would sit them down and tell them what he meant. So let's see what Jesus does do in verse 20. Jesus sat them down and said, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a, that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. Amen. So does Jesus actually tell them what's about to go down? Eh, not really. He doesn't say, I'm about to go to the cross, I'm going to die, three days later I'm going to... He doesn't say any of that, right? Instead of telling them what's going to happen, Jesus explains to them what their reaction is going to be to what's going to happen. Listen to verse 20 again. I'm going to read it out of the, the Message Bible because I like how this sounds. Listen to this. Jesus said, fix this firmly in your minds. You're going to be in deep mourning while the godless world throws a party. You'll be sad, very sad, but your sadness will develop into gladness. I like that version because it really brings it out. What would cause the world to throw a party and the disciples to be full of tremendous grief? What do you think? Hmm. Okay. 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 Yeah. How about the death of Jesus? How about the death of Jesus? Why would the world rejoice at the death of Jesus? Does the world love Jesus? No, the world hates Jesus. So they're going to rejoice at the death of Jesus. And yet the disciples, thank you, the disciples who love Jesus are going to be sad. They're going to grieve. But notice the great promise that Jesus makes. Their grief is going to turn into what? Joy. joy. See that? Joy. What is joy? Interesting question. I think often we get confused between joy and happiness. We think of joy and happiness and we kind of equate the two to be the same. They're both very similar, but there is a distinct difference between the two. And when I was looking this up, because I've always been confused by that, joy and happiness, they sound like the same thing. Uh, there's a lady named Rachel Fernley. She actually wrote an article about joy and happiness and the difference between the two. And this is what she writes, very interesting. 
She says joy and happiness are wonderful feelings to experience, but are both very different. And here's the difference. Joy is more consistent and cultivated internally, whereas happiness tends to be externally triggered because on, of other people, places, thoughts, or events. In other words, joy is something that comes from inside, right? You can be joyful without being happy per se. Now, usually they go hand in hand, but you don't always have to be happy to be joyful, if that makes sense. So joy, if you look in the, uh, the Greek, the word joy is kara. That's the, that's the word joy in the Greek, kara. And here's the Greek definition. It kind of similar. It says kara means a feeling of inner gladness, delight, or rejoicing based on spiritual realities. And it goes on to say, it is a depth of assurance and confidence that ignites a cheerful heart, which leads to cheerful behavior. And finally, it says, joy is a part of God's very essence and his spirit manifests supernatural joy in the believer's heart. Wow. Have you ever heard of a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Anybody here ever heard of him? A few of you have, a few of you have. Right. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he lived in Germany in the 1930s. Anybody know what was happening in Germany in the 1930s? Pretty crazy stuff happening in Germany in 1930s. A guy named Hitler, right, starting to rise up and his party, the Nazis, were starting to take over. So it was a pretty, pretty turbulent time to live. And in the 1930s, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1937, because it was getting so scary to be part of the church. The church was starting to go underground because Hitler was really coming down on them. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he created a, an underground seminary where he began to train pastors to continue to be men of God, continue to teach God's word, even as it was becoming illegal. And at the time, some of these pastors that he was training were caught. And the Nazis forced them to fight on the front lines for Germany, which, of course, meant almost certain death. You can imagine, right, being forced to fight for the very people that you are deeply, deeply against. Dietrich Bonhoeffer became a prime target of the Nazis, and he continued to stand for Christ, even though they told him to stop. And in 1942, he was finally arrested. And just a couple of days before the war ended, he was put to death. He was executed, barely right on the cusp of the war ending. But before he was arrested, he wrote a secret letter to all the pastors that he had been training. Now, these were pastors who were in the midst of the worst calamity ever being put on the human race, being forced on them by a madman who was trying to take over the world. These were pastors who were starting to lose hope. And this is the, these are the exact words that Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote to these pastors. He said this, a sort of joy exists that knows nothing at all of the heart's pain, anguish, and dread. These things, pain, anguish, and dread do not last. They can only numb a person for the moment. The joy of God has gone through the poverty of the manger and the agony of the cross, and that is why it is invincible. It does not deny the anguish when it is there, but it finds God in the midst of it. That's heavy stuff. I've heard it said that the word joy can be broken down like an acronym. And this is something we teach the kids in Sunday school, but you know what? It's so true. J stands for Jesus. Put Jesus first. O stands for others. And Y stands for you. Put you last. Right? Put Jesus first. Put others first put you last. With Jesus' two commandments, abide in me, love one another, Jesus, others, and then you, die to self. And if you do that, you're going to experience joy in your life because you're putting God first. And what does God tell us to do? To put others first before us. Now, Jesus is going to illustrate what this joy is going to look like by giving us a wonderful picture in verse 21. And I love this. I can't relate to it really, but I love it. 
He says a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come, but when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because her joy that of, because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. Can any w women here uh, relate to what Jesus is saying? <laughs> I, I've never had a baby that I know of. <laughs> But Nancy has, and she, uh, I, I'm going to defer to Nancy. Nancy, tell me what you told me, tell them what you told me when I asked you about this verse, about what, what it means to have that child born. Yeah, right? I mean, she just had a child, but. Yeah. <laughs> And you know what's interesting? She didn't say it just now, but earlier when I asked her, she said, at the very end of that, she said, and you're ready to do it again. Because <laughs> she has a tree. Yeah, Gail's like, I never said that. <laughs> Some of us never said that. <laughs> we'll just have one, thank you. <laughs> I only need that pain one time. <laughs> Pretty good picture, right? Pretty good picture of pain into joy. I think Jesus knew a little bit about that. I mean, he created women he knew exactly the process that they went through when 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 he said these words now earlier i mentioned to you those 12 boys and the coach who were stuck in the cave now it took several critical weeks but rescuers finally made contact with these boys and the coach and lo and behold they were all alive and some of you remember may remember just a couple of weeks ago july 10th all of the boys and the coach were rescued now, what was crazy is that these caves were being flooded, so they could have easily have drowned or, you know, it was really, really scary stuff. But earlier I asked you how you thought the family felt earlier when they didn't know if their children were alive. How do you think they reacted as soon as they found out that their kids were alive and coming home? There's actually a YouTube video you can look at and they just, it's spontaneous. They just break out in celebration. And you can check it out on YouTube. It's really amazing. There's, there's just incredible joy that they have. Now think about these disciples in the room. What is it going to take for them to go from getting lost in the undertow of grief to an exuberant kara, to an ex excuse me, to an exuberant joy that cannot be taken away? What do you think it's going to take for that to happen? Yeah, surrender. Well, we have hindsight, right? They didn't know. We have hindsight today. We know something they don't. We know that Jesus here is speaking about his death and his resurrection, right? And joy comes from the whole package, the whole thing. We rejoice in his death because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice who took away all sin. And we rejoice in his resurrection because he's alive today. He's our Lord and Savior. And if it wasn't for the resurrection, none of us would have any hope that should be enough to give us joy to know that we have hope to know that we are going to go to heaven to know that jesus did that for us let me ask you this morning do you have that kind of joy in your life amen now i'm not saying are you happy i'm not asking you if you're free from pain or if you're not having any trials that's a different question but do you have joy from knowing that you know what you know <laughs> amen right amen if you know Jesus you've been saved Jesus is working in your life and my hope is that your faith cannot be shaken now some of you might be saying well I'm not sure if I have that kind of joy I mean you don't know what I'm going through right now let me share something a little personal with you and uh, I don't say this lightly because it's not the kind of thing you go around telling people but there have been times in my life as a Christian where I've gone through some pretty heavy, deep depressions. There have been times in my life where, just like John Lennon, I've said, help me if you can, I'm feeling down. There have been times in my life where if it wasn't for Jesus, I don't know what I would have done. But even in those times of that kind of 
feeling. I had joy in knowing Jesus. You see, there's a difference. I knew that I knew that I knew. No matter how depressed I might have got because the chemicals in my brain weren't working right or whatever, I could still have joy because I knew Jesus. And that's the thing. Jesus wants to... Hey, guys. <laughs> Jesus, wants, Jesus wants to... Uh, he wants to take care of you just as you are, no matter how you are. You don't have to be perfect to be a Christian. So many people get caught up in thinking you have to be perfect to be a Christian. It's not true. All you have to do is just be willing to come to Him. Amen. You know, the world can't take away your, your, your grief. If you're grieving, the world can't take that away. You know, the emptiness, the world can't take that away. You can party all day and you can party all night, but it's not going to fill the void that's in your heart. You can chase relationships, but they're not going to fulfill you the way that Jesus can. Don't you want that joy in your life? And you can have it right now. You can have it today. You can give your life to Jesus. He'll take away that pain that you might be in. Now, this joy in knowing Jesus comes with an incredible promise an incredible benefit for the Christian. Notice what Jesus says in verse 23. He says something very interesting here, a little controversial. Jesus says, In that day you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. All right, so this is what I want to do. I want us to break up into our groups, and you guys should all have, if you don't have it yet, you'll get it soon. You'll get your uh, questions, and I, we have some questions based on these two verses about prayer, about asking the Lord, and, and stuff like that. So break up into groups. If you don't have a group, make sure you find one. And I think Chris is coming around with the questions. And I want you guys to spend about 10 minutes you're going to need your Bible so that you can answer some of those questions and then have some discussion time on what Jesus meant when he said these words. I'll give you about 10 minutes to discuss it and then uh, we'll meet back together here and see what you guys came up with and wrap it up. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to wait till everybody gets a gets in a group and then I'm going to start the stopwatch. And I'll give you 10 minutes. All right, here we go. I'm starting to start watch. Stop watch now. You're starting.
Okay, we got about two minutes. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Slow down the clock. All right, start wrapping it up, about 20 seconds. All right, let's wrap it up. Hang on, hang on. Okay, we'll give you 20 more seconds. <laughs> Okay. All right, let's wrap it up, you guys. And if you, if I'm, it sounds like there's a lot of good conversation. So as soon as we're done here, I encourage you to keep having that, that time fellowship. So how do we do? Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Good, good. All right. So Jesus says, in that day, you will ask me anything. So this is the day that Jesus is going to eventually depart from them, right? He's going to send them the Holy Spirit. He's going to ascend back to his father in heaven. So who are they going to begin to ask at that point? The father, the father right? The father, right? And he says, they will ask the Father, and He will give them whatever they ask for in His name. So let's think this through a little bit. Um, so if I ask the Lord for a million dollars, what do you think? Is He going to give it to me? Even if I ask in Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, I want a million dollars in Jesus' name. <laughs> possible. <laughs> he's giving me. He's giving me an out there. It's possible. <laughs> Amen. That's true. That's true. Oh, okay. I think you said something very key right there. If, if he if he wants you to have it. Very good. I like what you said. So let's talk about this. Let's think this through. First of all, what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? Let's start there. Because who is Jesus talking to? He's talking to his disciples, right? He's talking to his followers. What does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? You're going to follow Jesus, right? You're going to follow Jesus and die the daily. die daily, right? Are you going to want to do the Father's will yes. if you are a disciple of Christ? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of things that we see here. First of all, a disciple of Christ is going to have direct access to the Father in heaven. And this is revolutionary because up to this point, you didn't have direct access to the Father in heaven, right? You had to go through the temple and all that kind of stuff. So that's no longer going to exist after Jesus, he says, in this day. So the second thing is that the disciple of Christ can pray to the Father in Jesus' name, right? And he's going to give them whatever they ask for. It's kind of a controversial verse. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, how are you going to seek to live your life? His way, not yours, right? So you're not going to be asking him for things based on 
yourself, like your, your own personal motivation. You're going to be asking him for things based on living his way, right? Yeah. Remember what Jesus said? He said, to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. So you're denying yourself. You want to do what God is calling you to do. And hopefully, if you're a disciple of Jesus, you're going to be living in obedience to him. A disciple of Jesus wants to do God's will. So in light of this, what are the kinds of things that a disciple of Jesus is going to pray for? Right. He's going to pray for the things that please God. And if you're following Jesus, then what's going to happen is God is going to align your will with his. And this is going to come out in your prayer life. Basically, that's what Jesus is saying. Your will, your his, you're going you're gonna to be aligning your will with his will. Or actually, he's going to be helping you do that. And then when you pray, you're going to be praying for the things that God wants you to pray for. And when you pray for the things that God wants you to pray for, you think he's going to want to give those things to you? Yeah, absolutely. Right? He wants to work through your prayers. So what happens when you see God working through your prayers? Jesus says you're going to have joy. You're going to have that joyful life. And again, remember, joy, Jesus first others and then you so you're 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 aligning you want to do the lord's will when you're praying that way there seems to be a correlation between our prayer life and the joy that we experience in this life so it's important that we pray it's really important that we pray especially if you want that joy in your life if you're constantly in prayer you're constantly connected to your father in heaven right god paul says to pray always pray without ceasing right so you're constantly connected and if you're if you're seeking him seeking to please him talking to him then you're gonna be in that relationship with him you'll see him answer your prayers let me share one last illustration with you then we're gonna wrap it up about prayer about asking the Lord for anything and he will give it to you right while crossing the Atlantic on an ocean liner uh, one of the uh, a very famous priests back in the day his name was F.B. Meyer not priest, I'm sorry, pastor. He was asked to give a sermon to the first class passengers on this cruise liner. And the captain asked him to give a sermon based on answered prayer. And so there was an agnostic man. An agnostic is somebody who doesn't really believe in God. They're not really sure. They're not an atheist, but they don't really believe in the God of the Bible. There was an agnostic man. He attended the service that F.B. Meyer preached. And later on, he was asked about it from his friends. They asked him, what did you think of the sermon? And he said, uh, I didn't believe a word of it. That was, his, that was his, uh, his answer. So he wasn't convinced. And that afternoon, F.B. Meyer went to speak to the other passengers on the ship. And many of the listeners who had already heard him speak um, the night before, including the agnostic, went to hear him again. And when the, somebody asked him, well, why are you going to hear him again? You didn't believe him the first time. And he said, well, I just want to hear what this babbler has to say. Now, before starting for the service, the agnostic man, he had put two oranges in his pocket. And as he was walking down the ship, he noticed there was a, an older woman, an old lady actually, sitting on a lounge chair on the ship and she was fast asleep, but her arms were out, right, out like that and her, her palms were open. And so this guy was kind of a joker. So he's like, I'm gonna put these oranges in this lady's hands just to kind of mess with her a little bit. So he put these oranges in these lady's hands and then just kept walking. He went to the service and Later on, he saw this lady, and she was eating the orange, and she was all excited. <laughs> and, and so he went up to her, and he said, you look like you're really enjoying that orange. And she said, yes, sir, my father is very good to me. Now, this was an old lady. And he said, your father, he goes, surely your father can't be alive. And she said, praise God, he is very much alive. And he said, what do you mean? And she said, I'll tell you what, sir, I've been seasick for days. I was asking God somehow to send me an orange. <laughs> she says, I suppose I fell asleep when I was praying. When I woke, I found he not only sent me one orange, he sent me two. <laughs> the agnostic was speechless and he gave his heart to Jesus. He couldn't explain it. You see, God loves his people, and when you pray in God's will, he's always going to bring an answer. Worship team, would you please come back up? My time is up, but before I close, I asked you a couple of riddles at the beginning of the service. Now I'm going to ask you something serious. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Hopefully most of you in this 
outdoor setting can say yes. But there may be some of you here that don't know. You see, Jesus, what he says about prayer right here, about asking anything in my name, he only says that to his disciples. He only says that to those who have a relationship with him. And the grief to joy, Jesus only says that to his disciples. If you don't know Jesus, you may still have that grief all through your days. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, or if you're, sure, if you're not sure that you do this morning, but you want to get to know him, it's very simple. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say a, a simple prayer. And as the worship team comes, they're going to sing a last song. But if you want to have a relationship with Jesus right now, I'm going to say a simple prayer. And all you have to do is just say it with me. You don't have to repeat it. You can just follow along with what I'm praying. But if you really mean it in your heart, if you want to have that relationship, if you want to understand, if you want to have the Holy Spirit working in your life, uh, he wants to meet you right where you are this morning. So let's pray, and then after we're done praying, I'll have the worship team lead us in one last song. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood for me, for everybody here. I admit, Lord, that I am a sinner. I admit that I have no hope without you. I admit, Lord, that I've had times of grief. Please forgive me, Heavenly Father, for those that I have offended. Please forgive me for offending you. I have nothing to offer you this morning but my heart. Please come into my life. Please work in my life to make me more like you. Please send your Holy Spirit to guide my steps, to help me to live for you. Please turn my grief into joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus. May your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you prayed that this morning, if that was you, welcome to the family. <laughs> and I encourage you to tell somebody before you leave that that was you this morning. And if you didn't pray that because you already know Jesus, then that's awesome. <laughs> because you can't have more joy than just knowing Jesus. Thank you, everyone, so much. God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday afternoon. And it's nice that it's a little cooler today. Uh, worship team's going to sing one last song. I don't know if Chris wants to come up or not, but uh, are you coming up or are we good? We're good. Chris, gonna, uh, they're going to do one last song. God bless you. And uh, if you need prayer,